doubts thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. Bearing, send him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sins. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to
Please be seated. Dear friends, we have come here this afternoon before God and before friends and family to unite Collins McMurray and William Sheffield in marriage for the rest of their lives. This is a relationship which God has instituted. It is as close and intimate as the relationship between Christ and his church. The Bible gives you to, and all of us, the love of Christ for his church as an example of your devotion to each other. Paul clearly defines the meaning of love when he says this, love has good manners and does not pursue selfish advantage. It is not touchy. It does not keep accounts of evil or gloat over the wickedness of other people. It is glad when truth prevails. Love knows no limits and no end to its trust and no fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. It is in fact the one thing that still stands when all else has fallen. May we pray a blessing upon this holy event. O oh Lord Jesus, who blessed with your presence the wedding feast at Cana in Galilee, bless also these, your children, Collins and Williams, who seek your favor this afternoon. Bless them as they pledge their love to each other. You who have made us to know perfect love, seal these two hearts so that no earthly power will be able to shake their faith in one another or in you. And may they so live that they will be able to enjoy life everlasting through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Who gives Collins to be married to William? Her mother and I.
Genesis 2, verses 18 through 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. The Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky, and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet they felt no shame. Collins, y'all take a deep breath real quick. You made it. You're here. Maybe even glance back a little bit and see who all is here to support you. <laughs> Look, I'm so excited to be here with y'all today. Um, William, I've known you since you were going into ninth grade. I've had the privilege of just seeing what it looks like for you to grow up into Jesus, for you to become humble and gracious, a loyal friend, a loyal son, a loyal brother, a great church league basketball player, I might add. (laughs) I've also seen you uh, just really become what it looks like to be a sinner in need of Jesus and to know what it looks like to repent and to know where grace, or rather who grace is found in. So now as I get to witness you becoming a husband to Collins, uh, I just want to tell you sincerely how proud I am of you and how how big of an honor it is to be here with you. Collins, I think it was at Ironstone Pizza that I met you the first time when William finally introduced me to you when you were uh, really young, but I've known you from afar, I felt like, for so long. But it was during premarital counseling that I got to know you really well, and I was incredibly impressed. Uh, For someone who is... So gracious, so gifted, so talented, your humble and quiet confidence uh, is what just pervades out of you. It's amazing. I know if I had near the gifts or if any of us had near the gifts or the accomplishments that you had, we would not be so humble, but Jesus has been kind to you. He's instructed you how to take the low road of humility, and I'm proud of you. I'm excited for you to become William's wife. As a couple, you requested that you wanted to be married, and Look at scripture and what that means for marriage. And so we looked at uh, Genesis 2, as Sarah Grace just read for us, and we're just going to point out a couple things about how marriage will surprise you. First, marriage will surprise you with a unique joy. If you were to flip back one chapter in the book of Genesis, go to Genesis 1, you will find the creation story from God's perspective. And I think it's interesting how God chooses to communicate what his creation is to us The Bible makes it known that creation is not at random, it is orderly, and God takes pleasure in it. He continues, as he creates, to say repetitively, it is good, it is good. Six times we hear that refrain. What I think we see there is that God is not creating out of boredom or out of indifference. He likes what he creates. It's almost as if it's written as a poem. He's singing over his creation. He's rejoicing over what he loves. He loves giving himself away. Fast forward to our passage in Genesis 2 where we get a zoomed-in view of man and woman and even this first marriage that blessed the earth. We learned back in Genesis 1 that man and woman were called to be the image of God together as they related to one another. And here in this passage, Adam's loneliness that God said wasn't good is then provided for in Eve. And you see Adam, just as God did over his creation in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, he bursts out in song. He says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. He shares in the joy that God had. He shares what it looks like to image God in this world by rejoicing and giving himself away. The unique joy that you have available to you through this marriage is participation in the joy that God has had within himself and his creation for all eternity. That he has delighted for all eternity to give himself away in love to the other. And William and Collins What y'all are signing up for today is that you are now the primary people, the other, 
that you are called to primarily give yourself away to. This person next to you is the main one that God has given you to image him and his love and even his joy in this world. So my prayer for y'all is that even at this moment, as I saw William crying as you walked down the aisle, that this joy uh, that is the joy that God has, that Jesus will show us as we walk down the aisle, adorned as his bride at the end of, at the end of all time, that you will continue to mirror his joy by the way you love each other and give, it, give yourself away. But we know that access to this joy isn't always easy. We've talked about this. Every marriage doesn't always have joy. So marriage will surprise you also with a unique fear. We talked about this in counseling, but marriage, we said that marriage doesn't change you. Marriage reveals you. Marriage exposes you. This is kind of scary to think about. But it's worth noting that being exposed, being left in alone, wasn't always a fear. Even in this passage that we just read, the last verse of it, Adam and Eve welcomed vulnerability. They welcomed exposure. They were naked and unashamed, the text says. The fear of being seen for who you really are, under the mask, under the disguise, doesn't come into the equation until the next chapter of Genesis. Where rebellion and sin enter the world, so does shame, so does guilt, and so does our instinct to hide. As a campus minister, I often hear students your age say that they are terrified of marriage. Commitment scares them. Marriage scares them. They don't feel like they're prepared. And to be honest, I kind of think they're right sometimes. Marriage is scary. If we really are who the Bible says we are, if we really are who we know we are, if we look in the mirror sincerely, then that means we're going to have to be seen by the other. That somebody will be so close to us that they will know even all our faults and failures. That our resume won't be what they see. Our reality is what they see. So we should be, in some sense, appropriately scared of marriage. Because in marriage, you're signing up for a covenant. A covenant relationship. I've heard it described as an unrivaled relationship of unwavering commitment. This type of relationship means that you're signing up to be fully seen, fully known, truly by the other. That you will see the other at their very worst, and you will also see yourself at your very worst. And being in a covenant means that you are called, equipped, and empowered by Jesus to see the worst in someone and not turn away. That's what Walker Percy says. The unique fear of marriage is that if you're doing it right, fully giving yourself away to the other, letting your guard down, letting your disguise down, letting your mask down, then you will both need covenant love from each other. You will have to know that the other will see the worst in you and stay. But how can we get this courage? How can we actually face this fear? Lastly, marriage will surprise you with a unique invitation. The original way that Adam and Eve handled their shame is still pretty instinctive to us. They run and they hide. They try, to imi- they try some image management. They grab fig leaves as protection. They try to get their act together. And in marriage, when the worst of you is exposed, perhaps you'll try to manage your image in all sorts of ways. Hiding your feelings from your spouse, perhaps working a lot and being a great provider, but being emotionally detached. Maybe it looks like being good teammates and good parents, but really failing to invest in your own relationship. But the thing we see in Genesis 3 that God in his kindness shows us is that fig leaves don't work. God reveals that to us because as he looked on Adam and Eve and their pity and their shame, he can't stand to see them so embarrassed. He can't stand to see them so vulnerable. In their vulnerability, in their weakness, in their failure, when the mask is off, that's when his covenant love is ignited. God goes in Genesis 3 and kills an animal, a sacrifice. He gives them the warm hide of an animal so that they can hide in it. He covers up their vulnerability with something much greater than fig leaves. We know on this side of the cross now that this was all pointing to the greater sacrifice. That God in his love showed us what true love, what a real place to hide is that is in his son who became shame and guilt and unmasked for us. In Jesus, we see that when God sees the worst in us, he doesn't turn away. He moves towards us with sacrificial love, cross-bearing love, giving us a better place to hide. The unique invitation of marriage is twofold, that you will be invited to be more seen and known than you probably ever wanted. The fig leaves don't work if true intimacy is going to flourish. 
but you will also be invited to know and to need Jesus more than you have ever had before. Because you're, when your attempts at image management fail and you finally get to the point where you realize that you can't do it yourself, your need for the cross will grow. Your need for a better place to hide will grow. We'll end with this. This is the gospel. That what we think will be the most fearful thing that we could ever encounter is actually the doorway to partake of the most beautiful and secure love and hiding place we could ever imagine. That we are invited, even in our shame, in our guilt, in our sin, even when the worst of us is revealed, to be invited into the arms of Jesus, who sees the worst of us and doesn't turn away. And that's what your marriage gets to model. So now, as we, in response to this great news of the gospel, we're going to make vows with one another. So if I would have y'all face one another as we take vows to one another about this covenant love that we have been promised by Jesus, and y'all get to model through this marriage. William, you're first. So as you look at Collins, repeat after me. I, William, take you, Collins, to be my wedded wife, and I do promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be your loving and faithful husband in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live. Collins, I'm going to have you say the same thing, so just repeat after me as you look at William. I, Collins, take you, William, to be my wedded husband, and I promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be your loving and faithful wife in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live. So we're gonna exchange rings now as a sign and seal of this covenant. So Collins, if you would take the ring. William, this ring that Collins is holding is a reminder that you, in the worst of times and the best of times, Collins has committed to never leave you or forsake you. Collins, as you place this ring on William's finger, repeat after me. I give you this ring as a symbol of my love and my promise to always be faithful to you. And with all that I am and all that I have to honor you. William, if you would grab Collins' ring. Collins, this ring that William is holding is a visual promise that he will always be faithful to you, cherish you, honor you, and to love you as long as you both shall live. William, repeat after me as you place this ring on Collins' finger. I give you this ring as a symbol of my love and my promise to always be faithful and with all that I am and all that I have to honor you. Let's pray. God, as these two have placed these rings on each other's fingers, we pray that you would place the seal of your loving approval on their marriage. Would you unite them in body and in spirit, giving them the grace and the patience necessary to fulfill these vows. Guide them together in the way of peace that they may love and serve one another with one heart and mind all the days of their life. Amen. William Collins, by the virtue of the authority vested in me by the church and the state, I now have the privilege of pronouncing you husband and wife what God has joined together. Let no man separate. William, you may kiss your bride.
Now, as we all prepare to go out into the world, and y'all go out into the world as a newly wedded couple, receive the Lord's blessing upon you and your marriage. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. It is my great pleasure and privilege to present to you for the first time, Mr. and Mrs. Schaffeld. Thank you all for coming. That is it. And y'all are uh, all invited to Iron City, Birmingham for the reception. I've been told that there are parking signs and some valet parking, but also street parking available. Y'all go in peace.